the cause has already been decided by the UNEP, but now they've got to find the evidence to back up those claims. Today, I have John McLean here from Australia. I come from a, originally from an IT background, and just in casual conversation, somebody mentioned to me that in the past, things have been a lot warmer than they were today. Um, it's despite all the scaring about uh, global warming. So I looked at the data. And with the IT background, it was fairly easy. And I kept finding that the data said something different to what we've been told. And I've just got more and more into the climate work, learned a lot from various experts. And yeah, I certainly agree with them. We've been misled on a whole range of issues. Yeah, I want to tell you something about how the IPC was created and the people behind its establishment. So we put the whole thing in context, including the IPCC's behaviour today uh, and how it goes about its work. It's quite an interesting story. And while there's a lot of complaints about the IPCC, when you understand where it's come from, you can see why it works the way it does, even though you might not agree the roots of the IPCC go back to a United Nations conference on the environment that was held in Stockholm in 1972. Out of this conference came the United Nations Environment Programme, the UNEP. It is a big player in what went on towards creating the IPCC. Now, hitting up this new organisation was the Canadian Morris Strong, who had been instrumental in getting the Stockholm conference up and running. Strong was often blamed for what followed. But he only stayed in the job about three years. And for most of the time, the UNEP was still getting organised in its headquarters in Nairobi in Kenya. Reports of UNEP meetings in 1974 indicate dissatisfaction with Strong's ma management. Probably only a matter of time before he was dismissed anyway. The new UNEP head was, was Strong's deputy, Mustafa Tolba, who had run the place since during Strong's many absences. He remained in the role and from late 1975 to 1992, through a period when some of what the UNEP said and did was pretty questionable. Tolbert seems to have been behind the UNEP adopting what's known as the precautionary principle, which is if the threats of serious or irreversible environmental damage, lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing measures to prevent environmental degradation. Now, the idea sounds okay, but what happens if the science that you rely on isn't 100% or it's later proved to be incorrect or even it's just a highly disputed? It could be chasing shadows, demanding action that simply isn't necessary. Tolber also developed a reputation as rather a bully. Fiona McConnell, who led the British negotiating team for the Montreal Protocol, which I'll mention some more in a minute, said of Tolba, Dr. Tolba continued to apply his bullying, cajoling, wheedling, and threatening tactics. He was unwavering courteous to the US because, as he told us all, he did not want to give them an excuse to walk out. But to everyone else, he distributed his contempt even-handedly. A laugh from Mr. Tolba in response to a proposal he did not favour was inevitably the precursor of an insult. Now, under Tolba, the UNEP got involved with the question of acid rain. They made a huge fuss about industrial pollutants being carried in the air to other countries, being taken up by rainfall there, and this acid rain destroying trees. The UNEP even said the world could lose 10% of its tree cover. Dying trees in Sweden were blamed on the pollution from Britain. The Canadian government even blamed deaths of trees on pollution from the US. Just one problem in Canada. The researchers in the field could find no evidence at all that pollution was to blame. They could find no sign of this acid rain. Some trees were suffering from an infestation, which was eating their leaves. Other trees had started to grow quickly in warm weather in early spring, but the weather turned cold again and killed off that early growth. And of course, it damaged the trees. Within a few years, it was found the acid rain scare was a wild exaggeration, other than in, in a few highly polluted areas, especially in Eastern Europe. It makes a lot of sense because the pollution would just simply be dispersed if it uh, travelled very far at all. Another thing they got all excited about was the uh, was ozone. And this was on the basis of a single scientific paper published in 1974, written by Rowlands and Melinda. The paper claimed that chlorofluorocarbons, better known as CSCs, were destroying the ozone layer. It's, it's a very wide band of the stratosphere where most of the ozone is found, and ozone protects us from some of the UV radiation from the sun. Now, CFCs are 
commonly used in refrigeration. And that meant there was an awful lot of use of CFCs around the world. The UNEP pushed hard for ban on the manufacture of use of CFCs, later adding other chemicals like halogens, and that ban became known as the Montreal Protocol. Even today, most people are convinced that CFCs have caused a hole in the ozone layer. There's just a few problems. There's not a hole, there's only a thinning. It only happens at certain times of the year, despite the CFCs being around for the, in the stratosphere of the entire year. Now, also, despite there being more people in the Northern Hemisphere, and therefore they use more use of CFCs, the amount of ozone over the Arctic is greater than the amount over the Antarctic. And while there's some thinning in the Arctic, there's more in the Antarctic. The thinning appears in the two locations offset by a few months, but not six months, which we might expect if it was a question of seasons. Like if winter caused it, we'd see the same thing six months apart. But that's not what we're seeing. As you'll see in the, uh, the graph at the bottom, we have very different patterns in the two locations. The thinning occurs at different times of the year. It shifts around. NASA also talks about minimum stratospheric temperatures, probably because the UNEP sometimes does and because some people have just tried to link stratospheric temperatures to ozone. But the relationship isn't very clear. You'll see that as the, minimum, as the temperature drops, that's the orange line, the ozone actually increases for a while, but then it falls and it's still falling even though the temperature is rising. And eventually the two temperatures rise. So the relationship is very unclear. The UNEP claims the CFCs are damaged the ozone layer, but there's good reason to doubt what they say. It doesn't account for the cyclic nature of the well, the holes or thinning, if you more correctly, or the differences between the northern and southern hemispheres. 2007 scientists discovered a natural source of halogens, which are known ozone depleting agents in the Antarctic. I think this is the, one of the volcanoes down there. It's putting up lots of halogens. Also, that year, it was found that a key step in the chemical process by which CSCs are claimed to act is too slow for the whole process to destroy the ozone. The next year, 2008, a Canadian researcher found a strong correlation between cosmic rays and ozone depletion. And more recently, he's looked at NASA data and concluded there's lots of thinning in the tropics too. So... Things aren't looking good for UNEP's claims. The Montreal Protocol started in 1987, ended into force a couple of years later, when it had at least 11 signatures. It's now just over 30 years ago. Last year, in 2022, the current UNEP head, Inga Anderson, said, perhaps the best example of UNEP success is the Montreal Protocol on the substances that deplete the ozone layer. This 1987 global deal fixed the hole in the ozone layer through which deadly radiation was pouring. Is this really fixed? Look at the hole size that NASA tell us is in the Antarctic. In very recent years, that, that hole is back up about normal levels. It's, there's no decrease in the hole size at all. And if you look at the uh, number of days, different sizes of the hole, we see that in the last few years, we're way up at quite high levels for holes of 10 million square kilometres or 5 million. But that's just counting the number of days. Just a few years ago, it was way down very low. 2019, for example, there were only 20 days when the hole was bigger than 10 million square kilometres. So actually, the hole has got worse since 2019. And yet the UNEP is claiming that things are getting better. The size of their hole or thinning, it's probably a factor of air circulation patterns and how the air moves around. So here's another way to look at it. The number of days that the ozone was below a certain level, and this plot is the number of days below 2,000 Dobson's units, the, the way they measure ozone. And as you can see, in the last few years, it's quite high compared to what we've had in the past. There's just no sign of that hole being fixed despite what the UNEP says. The acid rains here, it faded, quietly faded away without great fuss or cost to anybody. The same can't be said about the ozone scare because it's cost the public a fortune in new refrigerants, both for refrigerators, for air conditioning. And if 
if I remember correctly, they started with one new refrigerant and then had to change it to another one. So it's cost people twice. But there's another UNEP issue that hasn't cost money so much as lies, about 20 million or more of them. This is the DDT sphere that grew out of the book by Rachel Carson, The Silent Spring. Now, DDT was used as an agricultural spray for many years, including in the USA. In various African countries, it was used mainly as an agricultural spray, probably funded by the UN or other international agencies. It seems likely that a certain amount was being diverted into spraying around the houses to keep mosquitoes at bay and reduce the threat of malaria. Perhaps some African countries were paying for it, but I think it would have been very tempting if it had been funded by somebody else just to divert a little bit and also kept the cost down for those countries. Now, the UNEP's argument was that DDT persisted in the soil, which was true, but really it's a question of priorities and which, which thing is worse. Sweden banned the use of DDT in 1970. The US followed just a, uh, two years later. After many years of discussion and lots of negative publicity from the UNEP and WHO, at a conference in 1999, agreement was finally reached to ban DDT as an agricultural spray. It wasn't specifically banned regards malaria control. That might be things that doctors had pointed out just before the conference, that its benefits as a defence against malaria outweigh the risks. But the years of negative publicity from the UNEP and WHO would need to discourage its use. The problem was the cost of alternatives. DDT cost between $1.60 and $8.50 per household. The alternatives cost $4.20 to $24. So we're talking of three times the cost. Yeah, the negative publicity and perhaps having no DDT for agriculture use to siphon off, plus the cost of alternatives, meant that many African countries no longer had good, cheap defence against malaria. You know, seven years after the ban on DDT for agricultural use was introduced, the World Health Organization declared that DDT was safe, provided that basic guidelines were followed. Some countries didn't wait quite that long for reintroducing it for malaria control. The UNEP produced a, I think it's a magazine called African Outlook. And in 2006, that magazine said, despite the environmental threats it poses, DDT was the most cost-effective and efficient way of controlling malaria. When South Africa stopped using DDT in 1996, the number of malaria cases in the KwaZulu-Natal province rose from 8,000 to 42,000. It's just four years later. South Africa tried various alternatives, but they proved less effective. Since reintroducing DDT, it's been able to reduce the number of deaths in the province to less than 50 per year. Now, by my calculations, we should have expected, we could have expected maybe 100, 120 deaths. So DDT was quite effective. But the overall, the UNEP and WHO's negative publicity about DDT and the ban for agriculture use caused an estimated 20 million deaths, just despite both organisations claiming that they care about human health. Kind of ironic, isn't it? So, to summarise so far, as it rain, ozone issues and DDT, three things where the UNEP's claims and demands have been very questionable. In the case of DDT, they failed to weigh the consequences of its demands and ultimately caused the death of millions of people. In the case of acid rain and ozone, it looks like the UNEP's reliance on the precautionary principle, acting before all of the science was known, caused it to act on, some, on the basis of some very questionable claims, and it pressured the world into taking false and expensive action. The big question is whether they, we can say the same thing about the UNEP's position on climate change. Now, the UNEP became interested in climate change in the 1970s. Throughout the 70s and early 80s, it commissioned various investigations by the International Council of Scientific Unions. Several of those investigations were headed by a, prof a Swedish professor, Bert Bolin, who had claimed for many years that CO2 emissions were causing warming. Back in 1959, in a visit to the National Academy of Sciences meeting in Washington, Bolin said the increase in carbon dioxide was believed to have caused the suspected warming trend of two or three degrees Fahrenheit in the previous 50 years. 
Now, that was reported in the New York Times. So he's saying this maybe 20 years before this work with the ICSU for the UNEP. In 1980, the UNEP got together with the ICSU or the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, to run a climate change conference of government representatives and scientists. It was inconclusive regards the role of CO2. Tried again a few years later, in 1985, inviting scientists individu- as individuals rather than government representatives. The report of the meeting wasn't written up for several months after the conference, not after the uh, attendees had gone home. It was claimed that there was a unanimous agreement that CO2 emissions were the major cause of warming. Now, I know someone who attended that meeting. They've told me that the agreement was far from unanimous. And he pointed out that back in those days, it was simply too difficult to contact everybody, gather opinions, and try to get that report corrected. So, yeah, that was the uh, report that the UNEP started spreading around rather falsely. Now, after claims about the conference, the UNEP, ICSU, and WMO recommended holding further international conferences on that subject. One of these conferences was organised in 1987, not by them, but by a Swedish think tank, the Bayer Institute, which had links to Bert Bolin, who we saw just before. The executive summary of that conference in 1987 says, among other things, it is generally agreed that if the present trend of greenhouse gas emissions continue during the next 100 years, a rise of global mean temperature could occur that is larger than any experience in human history. The, this is in the executive summary, and the irony is that in that, re- that executive summary has 17 points. The words could and might appear in 13 of them. So there's an awful lot of speculation there. The next year, 98, there were two events that really accelerated the climate alarmism. The first didn't have UNEP involvement, but influenced the second one, which did. This was James Henson stage managing his presentation to the US Senate on a hot June day in Washington. His ally, Senator Tim Worth, said later in, the, in an interview, what we did is that we went in the night before and opened all the windows, I will admit, right? So the air condition wasn't working inside the room. And when the hearing occurred, there was not only bliss, which is television cameras and double figures, but it was really hot. The wonderful Jim Hansen was wiping his brow at the table at this hearing, at the witness table, and giving this remarkable testimony. Now, much of the US was in drought and suffering a heat wave at the time. Hansen told Congress he was 99% certain that the heat wave was due to carbon dioxide and that heat waves would get much worse starting in just a few years. Hansen was wrong. I think I would say that fairly emphatically. There were two main reasons for the warm conditions in Washington at that time. One was that droughts cause higher temperatures and the US was a lot of the US was in a drought. There's just less moisture to evaporate and therefore more of the sun's radiation heats the ground, and that heats the air and raises the temperature. The heat isn't used to evaporate. The other reason is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's well known for influencing global average temperatures about six months later. There's a bit of a delay while its effect spreads around the world. Throughout the 1980s, the ERD ENSO, that's an abbreviation, is very much in the El Nino direction as NOAA's multivariate index shows below. Now, the blue blue figures in that show the cooler periods, which are the La Nina time, but we only call it La Nina if it extends for more than about three months. So there were very short La Nina periods there in the 1980s, and quite a few El Nino periods, and two of those last more than 12 months. One that started in 1982, one that started in 87. And the one that started in 87 went right through until the start of 1988. So if you add six months onto that, you're getting to um, into July of that year before the effect really went away. So this is what was causing the heat in Washington. It wasn't James Hansen claimed was causing it. Now, later in that same month is Hansen's presentation to Congress. There was a conference in Toronto 
run by the WHO, UNEP, and Environment Canada. After Hanson's theatrics, the conference received lots and lots of attention. At this conference, uh, William Mansfield of the UNEP, the staff of Tolbert, didn't attend. I'm not sure why, but Mansfield was representing the UNEP. He referred to the success of the Montreal Protocol regards protecting the ozone layer. He then went on to say, the challenge we are addressing this week, climate change, most certainly have profound impacts on the social fabric of the Earth's inhabitants. It must be a top priority for the international community. It is a top priority for the UNEP. Because the problem is man-made and global, no effective solution is possible without broad international cooperation. Now, notice that he's already decided there's a serious problem and that mankind is to blame rather than natural influences. He's already saying this. The evidence is very, very thin, but yes, he's quite emphatic. So this conference, coupled with Hansen's theatrics, led to the US supporting calls for the establishment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a UN body sponsored by WMO, which is actually part of the United Nations, and the UNEP. Author Shodul Agrawala said in his 1977 book, while the WMO was a natural sponsor for such a process, so this is a study of on climate change, it didn't have sufficient expertise to cover many other relative, relevant aspects of climate change, such as policy responses. This argued for the UNEP's involvement, that the US had some reservations about Mustafa Tolba. This is because he had alienated many close allies of the US in Latin America during the ozone negotiations. There's thus a keen interest on the part of the US not to let Tolba run climate change with the same degree of control which it wields over ozone. Now, we, we saw something about Tolba before, so it looks like Agrawala and it's reporting that the US had similar views about him. Now, the IPC got underway at its first general meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, November 1988. At the first meeting, Bert Boland, who we saw before, was elected chairman. Now, he, he, as I said, he'd been saying for 30 years that CO2 emissions were causing warming. And to be honest, his credibility was going to suffer if CO2 was found to be posed negligible threat, cause little warming. So, yeah, what he'd said in the past, his reputation was on the line. You know, according to the report of that meeting, Mustafa Tolba, UNEP head, expressed satisfaction at the extent of concern shown by political leaders and policymakers to the threat posed by climate change. He, it's reported in the notes of that meeting that he went on to say, the panel should, as a first step, identify the agreed facts and projections, separate them from mere speculations, and bravely inform the world what ought to be done. Now, again, he's decided, already decided there's a serious problem. It's man-made. The world will need to take action. And again, the evidence is very weak. In fact, the IPCC's real role was to find and present that evidence. So, yes, it's, the cause has already been decided by the UNEP, but now they've got to find the evidence to back up those claims. But Tolbert wasn't the only person saying this. This is curious. Representatives of 18 countries, plus what would later become the European Union, spoke on the subject and the the need for the IPCC. Most expressed a doubt, sorry, most expressed a need for proper research, expressed a willingness to work with the IPCC. But a few of these comments stand out for various reasons. Australia, Norway and Sweden said there was urgency to solve the problem. Canada and the USA said there are many uncertainties. Japan and the UK said that there's both un- urgency and unser- many uncertainties. India said there was a projected environmental crisis resulting from climate change. Only Israel expressed any doubts. It had some reservations about the whole thing. It pointed out a few potential causes of recent temperature changes. But, of course, it was ignored. At that first meeting, various countries asked for more research. And I think that people are mistaken about the IPCC. 
because it does no research other than ask certain climate modeling teams to model various scenarios simply so it's got a, a range of things to present in its response. The IPCC's principles document, that's a principle of its operation, tells us the role of the IPCC is to assess on a comprehensive, objective, open and transparent basis the scientific, technical and socioeconomic information relevant to understanding the scientific basis of risk of human-induced climate change, its potential impacts and options for adaptation and mitigation. So, so it summarises this different data uh, that in some way relate to human-induced climate change. It doesn't look wider at all possible causes of climate change. There's no UN agency that does that. Maybe if there was a UN agency that investigated solar influences on climate, it would tell us that most climate change was due to changes in this related to the sun. But why at this first meeting did these countries say there was a problem and it needed to be addressed with urgency? They were alarmed because the UNEP had been pushing the idea very hard on several fronts over the previous few years. And since James Hansen's presentation, the media was much more interested and was reporting widely and uncritically. The US agencies have access to a huge media machine, produces press releases in multiple languages, and most if not all, of the media seem to have blind faith in UN agencies. And they'll repeat what those press releases say. They just don't question them. Few journalists have ever expressed doubt because, A, most journalists are ignorant of complex scientific matters. And I think you'll find most journalists, if they have any university degrees, it's usually in arts or some similar field, not science. And of course, the UN is seen as some kind of demigod that never makes a mistake about anything. It's interesting, the UN is also not answerable to anybody in any higher authority. Now, with the uh, media reporting, the members, members of the public form their opinion on the basis of information that the media supplies to us. So given how the media reported the issue, of course, public opinion became aligned to what the UN agencies were saying. I think it still goes on today. Our opinions are influenced by what the media tells us. From the government point of view, there's also some other problems. Getting involved in agencies like the UNEP and IPCC or certain obligations onto governments or put, certainly put certain pressures on them. By becoming members of those agencies, they get the right to vote on decisions made by them. And while for simple UN decisions, it's a matter of one country, one vote, when it comes to written decisions, it's more a matter of the text being negotiated being between government representatives. The IPCC summary for policymakers, case in point, this is where government representatives get together to decide the, uh, the text of those documents, and there must be unanimous agreement on the, the text. So ultimately, the wording is negotiated between those representatives, and compromise is pretty much the norm. So if someone doesn't agree, and they've got to meet halfway. So you, you get this pressure on governments to, this pressure on governments is coercion from people like Mustafa Tolba, but they also have to contend with. Ultimately, the government usually take position, the same position as those decided at and by UN agencies. It would be odd if the government rejected something that its representatives at a UN agency voted in favour of. So Governments tend to uh, to go that way, and it's very difficult to change a government's opinion. Now, yeah, the, the UNEP has suggested the development of the protocol, the Montreal Protocol to protect the ozone layer, is an appropriate way to deal with the climate change issue. And it's a good working template. On that issue and on climate change, the UNEP alone, or in concert with the IPCC and other agencies, has decided the science in the situation before the issue was properly investigated, use media releases and, and even public figures to force its ideas in the public, made claims for which there's little or no evidence, certainly made claims prior to evidence being presented. It's got inconsistencies in some of its arguments. Uh, it's ex ignored plausible alternative explanations, many that involve natural influences. It's, it's pressured governments into agreeing with it and spending a large amount of money on research that supports its claims. 
it's basically coerce scientists into agreement. If they want a job, if they want employment, they have to go along with the research that supports the, those claims. And it also seems unconcerned about negative aspects as demands have on the public. So not a very good record from the UNEP. I was thinking about this, and it seems that approach is very, the UNEP's approach is very much based on Tolbert's management style. We've already seen comments about Tolbert and what people thought of his management. Paul Natal, who worked in the UN administration roles for 45 years, including as a director of the UNMP's Environment Fund, that is the financial part, I think, associated with the UNEP. And he commented on many, Tolbert's management approach, saying, in this position, as UNEP head, he often felt a personal responsibility to involve himself in detailed aspects of the work of the Secretariat that in good administration practice are usually entrusted to line staff. Tolbert had been a Minister of Higher Education in Egypt, and I assume that his management style probably reflected the culture of the Egyptian civil service. As I say here, in today's language, where I live, Tolbert would be regarded as a dictating micromanager. Now, I'm not saying the Egyptian civil service still operates like that, but it may well have done in the early 1970s when Tolbert had been a minister there. There's, I think there's a better way for the UNMP to operate than the autocratic style of Torwell that's uh, created the IPCC and other UN agencies. And the better way is to adopt a style now used by other UN bodies. It's leadership and cooperation. This approach is basically saying, we think there might be a problem. We'd like your help to investigate. And if there really is a problem, We'd like your help with devising a way to deal with it. There's three phases to this that are sequential. And reviews are held at the end of phases one and two to decide what happens next, including one possibility that no further action is taken. This approach is open, based on evidence, exposes the reasoning, makes no initial assumptions, and it gets progressively reviewed. And unlike the UNEP's approaches to date, it thoroughly investigates the problem before including or before considering some possible solutions. The first question is, is there really a problem? What is the monitoring? And I'll put in brackets, is the monitoring accurate? Because it's doubtful that the temperature data that we use is accurate. What does historical data tell us about this or similar situations? Is there a genuine threat? Are there, are there potentially detrimental impacts? Are there benefits to humanity that counterbalance that threat? Again, this is something the IPCC has ignored some of the positives about slight warming and how might the situation, the threats and the benefits all change in future. They really need to understand whether there is a problem. Then it's a question of understanding the causes. And it's a, a matter of looking at all the potential plausible causes of the problem and how does each cause operate and to what extent might or do they contribute to the problem. And can they manage, be managed or controlled in any way? There's no point doing, trying to do something if we simply can't control them. So we need to understand what's possible in regard to potential causes. And the third one is to look at what countermeasures we can, might take. What countermeasures are possible? What benefits would they bring? Can we quantify those benefits? What the cost of the countermeasures? How do they compare to the benefits? We need to know these things. Yeah, that's simply cost-benefit analysis. No one seems to do that. Now, with our energy policies that we're seeing at the moment. Now, are the countermeasures available? Or do they have to be developed? And if they have to be developed, what are the obstacles for the estimated time? What are the obstacles regarding implementing those countermeasures? And how can they be dealt with? So we need to explore all these issues in a, a much more cooperative way than the UNEP has been doing. So the approach, open, based on evidence, looks at the reasoning, makes no assumptions, and is reviewed. Yeah. So it looks to understand the problem and its causes before looking at the solutions. Whereas the UNEP has decided that there is a problem and this is the cause, and it's named a cause, before it actually has evidence, good evidence to say that that is the cause. The big question, of course, is whether we 
could apply this approach to climate change without there be too much resistance? Well, thank you for your attention. Okay, very good. I really enjoyed that. What do you think is going on with the ozone hole that you showed a graph showing that it was really low in 1979? Do you think it's fluctuating with temperature and we're going to, if the earth cools a little bit, it's going to go back to where it was in 79? I honestly don't know what's happening with the ozone layer. I know that ozone is destroyed in inverted commas when methane is converted to carbon dioxide in the stratosphere. There's a process there that uses the oxygen in ozone to convert the methane to carbon dioxide and water. Now, up in the stratosphere, that's good because more CO2 means more infrared gets radiated out into space. And it's creating a very small amount of water. About The concentration is about four parts per million, which is nothing. But that is chewing up the ozone. Now, whether there's any link to it, I don't know, because there's nothing that increased at the kind of rate that started off in the first couple of years. So if I go back to that picture, what we see here is that a black rise through, well, to about 1979 to 1986. And there's nothing that I'm aware of that increased so rapidly as to cause that kind of change. So I really don't know what has caused this hole. It Perhaps it is cosmic rays. I don't know. I don't have an answer, but I know that the UNEP's explanation is also very doubtful for a number of reasons. Very interesting. Do you have any other points you'd like to make before we wrap up? Well, basically, you can understand why the UNEP operates the way it does. The interesting thing is that the, UNEP, the IPCC took a lot of uh, lessons, if you like, from the UNEP in how to approach this. Its other co-sponsor is the WMO, which is a, a relatively quiet body that was concerned with whether it's got more alarmist lately. But yes, it, it had little experience in things like government policies. So the IPCC learned a lot from the UNEP, and it learned a lot of what Mustafa Tolba developed within the UNEP. So do you have any guesses as to where the IPCC is going from here? Are they going to keep meeting you know, next 10 or 20 years? Any ideas? Oh, the, unless things change, the IPCC will keep producing reports that might change them to a more continuous style of reports. Uh, like we have group, working groups one, two, and three at the moment. They might change that, that one year there's a working group one report, the next year working group two, the next year working group three, and then it's back to one, just because of the sheer volume of work. What used to take five years has been stretching out to almost seven years now or more. So it is becoming a, a big job. The, the whole report is growing so large, it's become quite difficult. So the UNEP might change like that. But changing the way it operates, I, I don't think we'll see anything in that unless – the weather turns consistently cold for a few years, then people might start to question what's going on. And yes, we might see some revision as uh, how these agencies operate and what they claim. Do you have any personal guesses yourself on whether we're going to see cooling between now and 2050 or 2100? Well, people who look at solar effects on climate claim that temperatures will fall I think that's a very interesting thing because it could be tested within a decade or two. These uh, predictions of what are, conditions are going to be like in 2070 or the year 2100, they're pointless because we can't test them. No one's going to be around that long. Certainly the people who've made those predictions won't be. Whereas these ones for the next decade or two, yes, they are testable, which is a very good thing in science. You always test your hypothesis. Excellent. All right. Any other points you'd like to make? No, I don't think so, Tom. You've, you've seen a lot of the science uh, in the last few weeks in various podcasts. There's a lot of science that questions the UNEP's claims about carbon dioxide being a major cause. There's a lot of very good science. It, it's just being ignored because the UNEP has basically brainwashed the, uh, the world into its thinking. I agree with that. All right. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that presentation. I'll try to get it online in the next day or two, but I will let you go. Thanks. Thanks again.